Salam and peace. Uh, this is Imam Malik Mujahid, and you're watching Muslim Network TV. Muslim Network TV airs on satellite Galaxy 19, covers uh, North America, north to south, south, east to west, Canada, USA, and Mexico. And we also stream on uh, OTT devices like Amazon, Fire TV, Raku, Apple TV. And you can download our app, Muslim Network TV, on your iPhone or Android phones. And our website is muslimnetwork.tv. Uh, uh, and uh, we are 84, we are, you know, always there uh, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. And this is a program which is designed to bridge, build, uh, build bridges of understanding and create harmony among neighbors. And today's show is specifically about that. You know, misunderstandings can be deadly. They can encourage people to wrong other people. And I will give you an example. When I was a young person in Pakistan, in a small village boarding school, there came a person, a Pakistani, claiming that he was a Christian, but he left Christianity. And I'm going around to warn people about Christianity. And he told us, and we were kids, we were just scared to death that, you know, for Pakistan, British uh, colonial powers uh, uh, occupied that line for 20, uh, you know, two, 300 years. So so the, the occupation was real as childhood would read about that. And he says they're about to reoccupy, and they are so bold in Pakistan. They even have an army, and they are not fearful. They dress like an army, and they have uh, ranks like a major and captain and things like that. He even gave us the name of that army. Only once I was in Chicago 40 years ago, outside a, a, during the Christmas time, I saw that army commander is standing with a bell in his hand asking for money. He was referring to Salvation Army. You see how an innocent thing can be blown up by person. Now I hear a lot of former Muslims going around in America, churches after churches, creating misunderstanding of the similar magnitude. Um, and uh, so that's why dialogue and conversation, understanding each other, sitting down with each other is important. Europeans, you know, colonized and enslaved almost all Muslim countries uh, for a couple of centuries, if not longer. Millions of people died defending their land against the invaders, especially the French invaders. Uh, so French freedom movement in the Muslim countries started about 100 years ago, 60, 70 years ago, countries started becoming free, but they were dictators and things like that. Some of the time actually stooges of the same colonial powers. So Muslims started seeing in the Muslim world, uh, white man as a Christian man, whether they are Christian or not, and considering them to be an oppressor and occupier and colonial powers. And when the, uh, these countries with dictators and uh, kings and these people will use uh, bombs and the tear gas to oppress people, denying them freedom, liberty, right to vote, select, the, choose their own life, they blame West. And that's where the element of freedom movement in the Muslim countries like Arab Spring but are not only calling for democracy and freedom and Islam and all of that, but also had element of being anti-West while asking for democracy. So, so this is very interesting conversation which goes on uh, in the Muslim world. Uh, and in America, it has a different take. Arab Spring uh, became successful in Tunisia. Democracy is thriving. Multiple elections have happened. A little bit in Morocco, but you know, Egypt, uh, you know, it was suppressed. It became successful, and then uh, military took over and it started killing people. And in Syria and Libya, Libya was bombed by a whole lot of Western forces, and it is in chaos just because of the Arab Spring. So instead of winning freedom. 
people were oppressed to the level in peaceful movement in Syria, asking for democracy, elections, some of them asking to live uh, uh, the way they choose Islamically. Oh boy, we know what happened. Two, you know, the largest number of refugees were created out of Arab Spring. Arab Spring was about freedom, liberty, justice. And many times when Muslims talk about justice and freedom, they also think of Islam because these are their ideals. But when they talk about Islam, somebody freak out in America. I say, oh, no, no, no. These people are dangerous people and all that. So a whole lot of confusion. In the midst of that, there are some good people. And these good people want people to know better. They want their neighbors to know better. There are Christians who want Christians to know better. There are Muslims who want Muslims to know better. And uh, instead of conflict, develop the relationship between them. And, and this movement is uh, growing. So today I Google the news. What are the news? The first thing uh, which popped up in Christianity today, which is a Christian evangelical magazine. I used to subscribe it at one time. I don't know why I stopped that. It says evangelical and Muslims not brothers, but best friends. So I still have to read that article. But the next one was Christian Leaders International Day of Prayers for Former Muslim Believers. Uh, quote, unquote, you are not alone. Uh, I mean, they have right to pray for who they would, uh, they, they would pray. But when Muslim reads that and they have history of knowing Christian missionaries, uh, they, they have a different uh, opinion of that. Next headline was Christian trying to convert Muslims and Jews to Christianity. Yeah, just it came out just 16 hours ago. And then another positive one, Muslim Christian communities share more similar ideologies than most realize. And this is, this is uh, printed in uh, Times West Virginia. So in the midst of this confusion, there are good people who are trying to have a dialogue. And sometimes these peacemakers have to pay a price. And one such beautiful human being who have done his best is with us, and it is former Congressman Mark Siljender. Peace be with you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Allah barak feek, ya Well, welcome, welcome. Did I pronounce Siljender correctly? Perfectly. Okay, all right. And your pronunciation of salam is perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Shukriya. So Mark uh, Siljander is former Republican U.S. Congressperson, serving for three terms in uh, the state of Michigan. He also served as U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations and author of best-selling and award-winning book, A Deadly Misunderstanding, a Congressman Quest to Bridge the Muslim Christian divide. Well, major Michigan, major, major, what did I say, Michigan? I mean, major mission there. How did you choose the topic you chose? Well, when I was in Congress, uh, the Saudi Arabian ambassador read from the Quran at the prayer breakfast. This was many years ago, and my I was probably twenty nine years old, and a very young congressman, and you. You, uh, mom, have attended the National Prayer Breakfast, I know. So I was very upset because I didn't like the Quran. I was told it was a, a bad book and I didn't care much for Muslims. And so I wrote a letter to the head of the prayer breakfast who visited me, my office in Congress. And he's, of course, from Christian background. And he said, now, you don't like the Quran? I said, no, I don't. He said, well, Tell me about your reading of it. I said, well, I haven't read it. Then he says, how do you know it's such a terrible book if you haven't even read the Quran? So I felt embarrassed. And he said, well, what's your plan for Muslims? And the plan is the same as you read, uh, Imam, you know, to convert them to Christianity. And so he started pressing me like, well, was Jesus a Christian? And I thought a minute and I said, I guess not. Did Jesus really start a religion called Christianity? I thought, well, I think he did. It's in the Bible somewhere. He said, well, give me one verse. And I couldn't think of a verse because there are no verses. To make a long story short, to prove him wrong, I bought a Quran translation. 
and began reading it. And my wife was in the kitchen and I was sitting reading it all with my pen ready to underline all of the, you know, terrible things in the Quran. Because that's what I was indoctrinated for years. And this is the problem. It's a deadly misunderstanding. That's why I titled the book that because I'm reading it. And I said, no, wait a minute. It talks about Adam and Eve and Moses. And it, it, it talks about the prophets from the Old Testament. It talks about Jesus repeatedly. And I shout to my wife. I said, Nancy, it calls Jesus the Messiah several times. Of course, I, I was just I wasn't counting too much. But I was starting just starting to read the Quran. So I that was probably 20 years ago. So I began studying the Quran with some uh, of, I would consider top Muslim scholars, Shia, Sunni, Sufi, very, diver, very diverse scholars. The book was ultimately endorsed by uh, Ayatollah from Iran, who's peaceful, and uh, Dr. S uh, Suleiman, who teaches Islamic studies at, uh, was at Edinburgh, now he's at Cambridge, and many other people, Christians, Muslims alike. And what changed my heart was when I started reading the Quran, I said, I'd better reread the Bible again, too. And I noticed that Jesus never mentioned the word religion in the sense of an institution or a club. In other words, a club you join. And as I started reading the Quran, I, I saw that it mentioned religion several times, the word in Arabic, deen. And then the scholars told me, of the Islamic scholars, that really the word deen actually means the state of your submission to God, to Allah. It's not a club. So I thought, wait a minute. If the Quran mentions religion not as a club, but as a state of one's faith and submission, and Jesus never mentioned word religion, nor did he mention Christian or Christianity, I'm not against it. He never mentioned the Boy Scouts, the Girl Scouts of the United Nations, so I'm not, and I serve there. But the point is, we attribute biblical or Quranic authenticity often to things that aren't even there. Or, in my view, they're dramatically misinterpreted or understood. So in reading the Quran, I was uh, transformed in the sense that, well, the Quran is just, to me, not, and I don't. I mean this with greatest respect. Kind of a rehash of the Old and New Testaments, and and uh, but my friends, Christian friends, yes, Mark. But they make Jesus is in the Quran. There's always the word but. But they don't believe this. They don't like he's not the Son of God. They don't believe in the Trinity. They don't believe he was crucified. All these different theological issues. And I'm all, and in concluding my quick summary of 20 years, I began researching the language of Jesus. He spoke Aramaic, and Aramaic is very similar to Arabic and Hebrew. They're, they're cousins, the three Semitic languages, Hebrew of the Old Testament, Aramaic of the New, and Arabic of the Quran. And to my astonishment, Imam, no scholars have ever looked at the Semitic language connectivity to see if we can overcome some of these perceived differences that I mentioned earlier, theological and other so-called differences. So I've embarked as a student, a talib, because I'm not a scholar, I don't have degrees in Islamic studies or linguistics or Semitic linguistics. So I've embarked on a study to compare keywords for example, what did Jesus call God? My Christian friends say, well, Allah is a fake God. I said, is it? Why do you think that? Well, there was a, a moon God named Allah, and they adopted it. I said, oh, so what should we call God then? Well, we should call him God. I said, do you know where the English word comes from? And 99.9% .9 of Christians don't know. I said, it, com it comes from a gut, a, a proto-Germanic word for a spirit, a demon or a spirit of spring water. So the word, English word God has pagan roots, if, if that's your concern. Well, then they said we should use the Hebrew Eloheinu or Elohim or Aloha. 
in various forms. I uh, said so come, that comes from the Canaanite pagan god El that the Hebrews adopted. They go, oh my gosh. I said, so if you're going to attribute so-called pagan origins, there's not a single word we can use in English, Arabic, Hebrew, Aramaic, or any other language. So getting back to what did Jesus call God? That's what they, let's use what Jesus well, let's, used. Let's take a short break, Mark. Thank okay. you so much. And we will continue this conversation. This is Imam Malik Mujahid, and I'm talking with uh, former Congressman Mark Siljender, and we'll be right back after these messages. My name is Adam. You remember me? I appeared in so many episodes that Sound Vision has put on the market. No matter what it is. Oh, no. Hey, what's happening? Hey, oh, sorry. Lockdown is what it is. Well, continuing here. In this lockdown, Sound Vision never stops thinking about you, the viewer. We'll have to get back into production again, online and in line. Everybody in their own space, e even me. Although I'm stuck with Lenisa. Salam! <laughs> Salam! Salam! <laughs> I, know, I know, you were shocked too. Well, l let me continue. Uh, this, is, um, this is what I was going to say. Salam! 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 Cut! 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 <sighs> Finally, I get my own screen time again. Thank God. And so we invested in new equipment to bring you even better production with new songs and new singers and animations. Well, here are a few clips. And Sound Vision has brought all this into your home, making Islamic values and teachings easy. And if you know me, Adam, a multi-talented actor, <laughs> well, sometimes I'm an actor and, and the reporter and the... Oh, that's enough. Let's move on to the next section. Well, you can watch these new episodes on our new app at www.adamsworldapp.com. We have previews happening every day on Muslim Network TV. 
sound vision has been serving generations, moving and changing with the times. We are all faithfully connected. That is a huge blessing. Your donation helps keep these programs available now and into the future. We take this job of helping tomorrow's Muslims today seriously, and you should too. Today, we need your help. Children absorb and learn from everything they encounter. Make that wholesome, positive, grounded in our faith. Together, we can accomplish our goal of raising better Muslims, better neighbors, and better citizens. Please donate generously. It's an investment in our future. But to finish, let me tell you there are new scripts of my new mission. And it is something that I enjoy talking about. My new mission is space. Houston, we do not have a problem. <laughs> Salam! See you soon! Welcome back to Muslim Network TV. And uh, this is Imam Malik Mujahid talking with uh, former congressperson Mark Siljender. So, so when you, uh, so, so what was your research about the name Jesus uh, took you to? Well, by the research, because I have, I've become uh, a kind of a thorn in some, in some evangelical circles because they think I'm an apologist for the Quran and Islam. And I say, I'm simply pointing out linguistic similarities, not theological, linguistic. Even Jesus called God Allah in Aramaic. You can hear the similarity, Allah, Allah, and that shocks Christians. So Jesus also used the word Muslim, a form of it, in the, in the sense of turning, turning your heart toward God. So. Even in Aramaic, the word Muslim, in a sense, is referred to as in the similar definition of one who is turned or submitted to God. So I will study Jesus in the Quran and have done extensive uh, research, and which shocks people, both Muslims and Christians, when they see very clearly how Jesus is, in fact, presented in the Quran and all the other, so many of the other prophets. And I... Frankly, in conclusion of this thought, I don't see a, 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 a much difference between the Quran and the Bible in, an, in Old and New Testament, honestly. And but give me this, uh, then, if, if there is so much common, if uh, if uh, Christians in the West know little more Aramaic, uh, it is going to be helpful in understanding, or uh, the differences are not as much theological as political? I think they're a little bit of both. And politics has, in my view, over centuries on both Christian and Muslims, politics, control, uh, division has, in a sense, uh, put barriers up. And so my, my goal in life has been to try to build a bridge over these barriers. And I was, I, we can give you an, if you have any interest, we can give ex specific examples that that would help. Sure. Okay. I was in, in a interfaith conference in, uh, sponsored by the King Abdullah when he was alive in Saudi Arabia. And the head of the World Muslim League was the master ceremonies. And after two and a half days of all the different religions speaking and talking, uh, he and I had a private audience. And I said, Your Excellency, after two and a half days of all these wonderful speeches, when you look at me, do you, do you think I'm a kafir, you know, an infidel? And he smiled and he said, yes. I said, well, thank you for your candor. So why, why do you think that if, since we're talking very openly? 
He said, well, you think Jesus is the son of God. And he mentioned a couple of the other, you know, the Trinity and a few other things. I said, well, what if in 12 minutes or less, we could bridge those questions or those so-called differences to, 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 uh, to mitigate them to cutting, splitting hairs, almost very little to no difference. And a lot of it's a linguistic issue. And he goes, what? He goes, that could change the world. I said, well, that would be a good thing if we could change it for the better and bring better understanding. He said, well, tell me about son of God. How would you deal with that? I said, well, the, the Aramaic makes it very clear that everyone but Jesus was begotten differently. And he said, what's the Aramaic word? I said, it's yelled. And he said, well, that's the same in Arabic or similar. I said, I realize that. But when it comes to Jesus, he, you, the, the Bible uses in the Aramaic a feminine construct with a passive form versus a male form of the word, in other words, sexually begotten. And it suggests that Jesus was begotten differently with no man because the Bible and the Quran both suggest that Allah or Allah blew his breath into Mary, who was a virgin. And Jesus was conceived supernaturally. And he looked at me, are you saying that this whole son of God is based on a misunderstanding of one word begotten? And that has my, been my argument for years and presented all over the world from Edinburgh University and Oxford to, to Christian and Muslim colleges all over the world. It's really down to a misunderstanding of a single world word. So, so around the world is a different thing, but what about around the USA? Has any, any Christian leader have understood what you're saying? Ah, that's a very good, insightful question. In the beginning, uh, no, they did not. But when I have an opportunity to, to show them and express it to them, I can't mention the name of the person, but you would recognize it immediately. Most people in the world would. He said my book was heretical and he had read it 15, like 10 years ago or something. And I met with this gentleman and, and I said, what is your problem? And I exp expressed to him the Aramaic to reminding him, even though he read the book and th within, I would say 30, 40 minutes, we were in agreement. He said, why don't we know this? More Christians and Muslims need to know that some of these so-called differences can be bridged, not perfectly. And frankly, mom, you know, there are so many sects and denominations of Christianity. Christians argue among themselves about, you know, the specifics. What does the Trinity mean? What does son of God even mean? Because Jesus said, peacemakers are sons of God. He, did he mean, what do you mean by that? And he said that the son's, Sons of God in the Genesis look down in the, and they're called angelic beings. So sons of God can be angelic beings. Kings were called, kings and, and the Roman emperors were called sons of God. So the word son of God has a huge diversity of meaning. The point is, was Jesus supernaturally conceived by the breath, the spirit, the ruh of Allah? And the answer is yes, Christian Muslims agree. So that's, mainly the 90% of the issue, and he is begotten differently. But the English Bibles look like he was begotten the same way that Abraham begot Isaac and Ishmael and all the rest. So it's as simple, it's really not as complex as we need to make it, we, we, we tend to make it. So in that sense, if, if, if you're able to talk to people one-on-one, -on -one, even, even significant leaders, um, then what stops them from uh, trying to bridge? Is it the politics of things? Well, some are bridging. You had uh, Bob Roberts on one of your shows, who's a close friend of mine. And there are more and more men and women, such as Bob Roberts, that are bridging the divide. Uh, a deadly misunderstanding has impacted I don't countless tens of thousands of people here and abroad. We sold 10,000 copies just in North Africa. And uh, so our goal is to influence people to think differently about their own faith 
and about especially uh, Muslims, that Muslims are like Christians. They're good and bad people everywhere. And the Quran, in my view, uh, says essentially what the Bible says. The, the, are there differences? Of course there are differences. But, but there, there are insufficient differences when you get down to it. Um, let's talk. I mean, the holiday season is coming close. Let's talk about how do you, since you have studied both and you have taken a trouble of, uh, you know, mastering Aramic language. I don't know how many people master that. So what's the difference uh, about uh, Mary, peace be upon her, uh, as she's mentioned in Bible and in the Quran? I mean, Mary is so big among Muslims, you know, my mother, I was uh, named after her. Uh, one of my daughter is named after her. And one of my granddaughter is named after her. Mary is very big in among Muslims. And uh, somehow I don't think my neighbors know about that. So uh, since you studied Bible and Quran both, how is the treatment different or similar? The, well, frankly, the, Mary is more... Uh, Emphasize in the Quran and the Bible. There's a whole, there's a whole uh, chapter on a Maryam, Mary, in the Quran. But actually, there, in terms of functionality, there's no difference. She was a virgin. Quran and the Bible. Uh, she was, she conceived Jesus without a man. Quran and the Bible. Allah brought his spirit into Mary's womb. In the Quran and the Bible. Jesus was was born pure and sinless. In the Quran and the Bible. He could heal the sick, the blind, and raise the dead in the Quran and the Bible. And it says in the Quran that the Trinity doesn't is, is incorrect. It's not God, Jesus, and Mary. Mary's mentioned as part of a Trinity, and there's no no one, no Christian thinks Mary's part of a Trinity either. So I don't see any difference and of any no, notable difference between the Quran and the Bible regarding Mary. So, but the main major difference comes in when uh, uh, Jesus is being discussed. I mean, uh, I mean, I will not be a Muslim unless I believe in Jesus uh, and other prophets. But we consider him a prophet, uh, not uh, God uh, himself. And we worship uh, the one which we believe Jesus worship. So how Jesus is treated differently in Bible and the Quran? Uh, I honestly don't see it, and we don't have time to get into it, but I'll give you an example. I was with uh, lecturing at a all-women's Islamic college, and they all were is conservative. They all were black, some hijab and others, you know, the full burqa. And they asked me to lecture on Jesus in the Quran. <laughs> I said, all right. <laughs> I said, now, ladies, I can do this in 40 seconds. Ladies, you know that Jesus in the Quran gave life to the better life to the sick, the blind, and the leper. And they said, yes, with the permission of Allah. He said, yes, and he raised the dead. Yes, with the permission of Allah. And they're all nodding their head. And he actually created clay birds with his hands and breathed his breath, his ruh. And these birds became living beings. Yes, he did that with the permission of Allah. And the Quran says he is the Messiah, the word of God, the spirit of God. He said, yes, this is all with the permission of Allah. So, well, let me tell you what the gospel said. Jesus said in the gospel, he said, I only do what Allah, that's the Aramaic, tells me to do and say what he tells me to say. And all permission was given to me to do these unbelievable miracles that are reserved mostly for God. I mean, who can breathe? Only Allah breathed on clay to create Adam in the Quran and the Bible. So he had these uh, re remarkable gifts given to him. And he, he said, yes, Allah gave these all to me. And they were shocked. They said, are you sure the Bible says that I'm positive? It said, and more. And he prayed to Allah. He worshiped Allah. He only, he wanted to keep on the, the, the asurat al mustaqim which is the straight path in his life. So I really don't see many differences. And I've written, you know, we, you can read my book and see some of the, like the Trinity and the crucifixion, all these issues that rip Christians and Muslims apart. Really, I think even those are misunderstandings of the language, 
of Arabic and Aramaic. You're watching Muslim Network TV, and this is Imam Malik Mujahid talking with Congressman Mark Siljender about uh, his work on deadly misunderstanding between Muslims and Christians. And we will continue our conversation after this break. My wife, who uh, she's a professor at the University of Cincinnati, who, who's Catholic, and by her watching and listening to our three-year-old son uh, watch Adam's World, she ended up taking Kalima Shahada. She embraced Islam because she learned so much about Islam and the other prophets. It really affected our life in a great way. And because of uh, Sound Vision and Adam's World, we're Muslims. I took my Shahada 15 years ago, and I actually am from a rural part of Ohio. And so I found the catalog for Sound Vision, and I ordered the the tapes and the CDs and the books, and I use those, and especially for my little daughter, you know, that's how we basically learned our Islam and Islam entered our hearts through the wonderful works of, of Sound Vision. Okay, Assalamu alaikum, brother. I just want you to know that I love the Sound Vision website. That a lot of times when I'm looking for information, especially as it relates to homelessness, domestic violence, and women issues, I go to that website and then I see what you've written and then I copy and paste it and spread the word because the wisdom is there. So I can't you know, I can't do any better than what Sound Vision has already done. Sound Vision is our survival uh, uh, guide. It is the uh, organization that provides skills for Muslims how to survive and thrive in this uh, community here in the U.S. Assalamu alaikum, my name is Anam, I'm in 11th grade and I grew up with Adam's World and what it taught me was unity, respect and love for the Muslim Ummah. Is Adam's World is the greatest show ever made. Take me to the Kaaba, man. <laughs> I love that puppet. Assalamu alaikum everyone, it's your brother Zain Bika from South Africa. One of the first educational programs ever produced for Muslim children was the ever popular Adam's World series. The colorful and comical Muslim puppets stole the heart of a generation. Sound Vision will be releasing brand new episodes of Adam's World with the launch of a Adam's World app. Subscribers will enjoy new Adam's World episodes as they are released, as well as all the classic episodes of Adam's World. So visit adamsworldapp.com now to learn more, subscribe and enjoy new adventures of Adam and his friends. And let's keep helping tomorrow's Muslims today. Assalamu alaikum. Adam's world, believe me, there's a lot to see. Bismillah, let's explore.
welcome back to Muslim Network TV. This is uh, I'm Malik Mujahid. I'm talking with Mark Siljender, who is a former congressperson and an author and a truth seeker who is building bridges of understanding between Muslims and Christians. So your research and study essentially, how many congressmen actually go around doing the research which you have done? Uh, well, zero. But however, I've traveled with many in the House and the Senate, the U.S. House, uh, and, and the residual effect of this research is congressmen, when they he especially Republican evangelical types, when they, when they hear how similar the Quran and the Bible, they're as shocked as I was in the beginning. So they travel with me to Muslim countries, and we share with the presidents of these countries the research rather than telling them what to do and threatening, like uh, often our government will do, we tell the Muslim leaders, we wanna be your friends, prayer partners, and share this research. And some of them are so excited, like Gaddafi, Saddam, Omar al-Bashir of the Sudan. Now these are, these are uh, unsavory characters in a lot of people's minds, but I became uh, very close to several of them and in the course of doing that, we became prayer partners. And then like Gaddafi, within 10 days of, of meeting with his regime, he released the Libyans that were that they were accused of blowing up the Pan Am jet over Lockerbie, Scotland many years ago. And within a year and a half working with his regime, there was a real approach from out of the West. You mentioned the bombing in Libya, I think in your opening remarks. And I did try to stop the Iraq war and using a similar approach, spiritual friendship, prayer partnership approach, but it was our side. It was uh, the Dick Cheney and the neoconservatives who threatened me with uh, uh, crimes because I, they felt I was interfering. And Omar al-Bashir deployed peacekeepers in war ravaged Darfur in the mid 2000s, only after we prayed and talked. And then he said, well, Let's work together. So we, so this research, Imam, what is net is more, much more than enlightening myself and other people. It's actually contributed directly to removing six conflicts, mitigation of six conflicts in the genocide in Darfur. Hmm. That is, so, so this is not just theoretical exercise for you. So this is exercise of love to bring peace a bit in America and other countries in which we are in conflict. Um, how has uh, this experience, I mean, you, you, it seems, have to pay a price instead of a friend and a congressperson who represented our country honorably in the United Nations, you became the target of uh, a vicious campaign of accusation in the media and lawsuits. Uh, well, what, I mean, did you foresee coming or you were surprised when it happened? Well, I was threatened by mostly the Bush administration. Uh, Clinton left me alone. Obama didn't, he, he, he didn't, he agreed generally with our approach. But it was the eight years of the Bush administration, mostly Dick Cheney and what they call the neoconservatives. They're war hawks. And they threatened me many times. But I felt maybe in arrogance, I, you know, please, Allah, forgive me, uh, that, oh, what are they going to do to me? Well, they can do anything to anyone they want and quickly. They accused me of, hang, of terror, being associated with terror funding with Muslims. I mean, it's, so, it's, it's me? I mean, it's so ludicrous. And I had James Baker, the former Secretary of State, Ed Meese, the former U.S. Attorney General, so many of my friends, Democrat and Republicans, come to help me. But once you're targeted, this even the president can't, well, whomever they might be can't escape it. Uh, whether you can hate Trump or whatever, but just think they just dragged him into all these investigations. They can do that to a president, good or bad or indifferent. Think what they do to a former congressman. So ultimately, the, all they could tie me in is I lied to the FBI about lobbying for US Muslim charity, and which I did not, 
But uh, they said if I didn't confess with that, they'd reindict me for more things. And it, and after years and years, finally I threw in the towel, was sentenced, and 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 uh, they found the final charges were lying and not registering uh, as a lobbyist. And they put me in jail for a year. And while in jail, I had this massive tumor that started out like the tip of a finger and became the size 18 centimeters, the size of, of a man's fist. And they gave me three months or less to live. And that was eight and a half years ago. So I survived uh, high level prison, survived what they thought was terminal cancer, and all of the attacks of the neoconservatives and, and attacking my reputation and trying to take me as low as they could, they're all gone. I'm still around and alhamdulillah, still traveling, making peace in Central African Republic, in, in the new Sudan, North and South, and still traveling and, and working and writing books and making, hopefully there'll be a movie about all this. It's not a, my initiation. But it, so I'm very excited and hopeful. I'm sorry to hear about all of what you went through. Um, I'm. I hope some friends stood by with you who were uh, you were trying to build. I mean, bridge building is not easy, and uh, uh, accusations and these are the tests. I mean, Jesus, peace be upon him, have been tested uh, by human beings. Uh, betrayed by some of the human beings, and uh, uh, they thought they actually hanged him. I mean, of course, uh, I mean, I as a Muslim don't believe God saved him. Uh, and uh, but, but you mention in this trial, uh, in in the prison, um, did. And, and when you were in prison, you got this uh, deadly form of cancer, which you, what you, what you survived. Uh, did that allow you some time for an extra reflection on everything which you have been going through because of speaking the truth? Well, it, of course it did. But I was so busy. Every day I was with people, morning, noon, and night. The prison fired me from any job. You know, usually inmates have jobs because they didn't want me teaching or being around inmates because I was sharing these bridge building ideas with Muslims and Christians, blacks and whites, uh, then even skinheads with nasty swastikas all over their bald heads. They had spiritual experience who so end up praying. Imagine this, skinheads, uh, gangbangers, inner city blacks, Latino gang members, Muslims all kneeling and praying together. And the prison said I was conducting riots, religious riots in prison. I said, I don't think kneeling and praying is conducting a riot. And then a uh, Muslim came up to me and said, the imam wants to see you. He's, he was an inmate from uh, Syria. And uh, all my friends, oh, don't go see them. Don't go see the Muslims. Don't do that. Don't do that. They're going to kill you. I said, no, why would they kill me? Because in my book, A Deadly Misunderstanding, there were 20 copies that somehow got into the prison. They were circulating all throughout the prison. Anyway, so I went to see the imam. And in his cell, there were four or five other Muslims standing around. And he had two copies of my book sitting on a makeshift crate in front of his, his in his cell. And he said, salam alaikum. And we embraced and he told me how his two sons were straying from Allah, and he read the book, A Deadly Misunderstanding. And would I please autograph it to each of his sons? He wants to send it to them. Hopefully, they'll come back to God. I mean, see, everything people warn me. Oh, don't go to the inner city black guys. They'll kill you. Don't go to the Latin gang members. They'll cut your throat. Don't go to the Muslim. It was just the opposite. Allah was full of Rahman, Rahim, mercy, compassion and love. So the very thing that worked with world leaders to make peace worked in the prison. I mean, it was just literally, so how can I be bitter? It was a horrible experience. It was frightening. Yes. Cockroaches and rats in this old, it's like the third world prison. They sent me to a 93 year old prison, federal prison. And they didn't send me to a camp, you know, cause I just in for five or six months of the year and I'd been out but they sent me to a prison. Hopefully I'd get killed. And just the opposite. People were gracious. And congressmen, senators, 
uh, were to, helping me on the outside because they knew I was railroaded, many of them. So I have nothing to complain about. Uh, it's all been a, actually, I look back at it, I feel stronger, better, healthier, and spiritually and physically. That's good to know. I mean, I, I admire your spirit on the type of challenges human beings go through in the life cycle if they if they believe in God, submit to him and uh, continue to do the good work of serving humanity. And what is serving humanity, the prophetic mission of uh, bringing peace and justice to people? Those people who were, you know, those some, some of the people you mentioned as uh, uh, neoconservatives and warmongers, did you have any chance after you got released to communicate with any one of them who were threatening you? Know, you? I, I was asked not to talk to any of them, but I have in my heart forgiven all of them for the false accusations. And uh, they had their political motives. See, what was happening, we found out later. General Wesley Clark, you might have heard of him. Of course. He announced just a few years ago that there was a secret policy in the Bush administration for regime change in the six or seven countries. And I was, in their view, meddling in at least four or five of them. And if the regime start behaving, they lose leverage to change the regime. And they thought, what is this former congressman doing running around the world with the regimes that we want to get rid of? And they start behaving. They said, well, what is he doing? And I would insist. And Netflix did an inter interviewed me on this. So I didn't do anything. So what do you mean? So I just showed up, shared my research, loved the people I was with, with Rahm. Rahm, you know, is the mo one of the most used words in the Quran. And Jesus used it and is translated often as love, including mercy and compassion. So I just use that word Rahm, Rahman, because it's such a, it's one of the most beautiful words that exist. Because Allah is full of Rahman. He's full of love and compassion. And you know, Resh Haymem, the root means the womb, the woman's womb. So the blessed is what comes from the womb. And this tender mercies, we love each other in that way. Friendship, which is hub, a different word, and rahm, which is tender mercies. God will do the rest. We have to just trust that, the, that God, through his ruha this the Quran calls the Holy Spirit, will work in people's hearts, including mine. And we don't have to push or do anything. And my life has been nothing short, honestly, of a miracle. And I'm thankful to God for all he's given to me, including the suffering. Not that I want any more, <laughs> but I have to say, uh, and I'll conclude with this thought. Jesus talked a lot about, very little him about being baptized. But he did mention the baptism of suffering in, in the Gospels. The baptism of, in other words, we, we're going to be immersed in the in, in suffering if we really follow also Rata Mustaqim, the straight path. So, yes, we suffered, we've survived, and I'm thankful. And thank, thank you for asking. No, thank you. Thank you for sparing your time on this. So, what is that uh, film is coming about? I mean, there are. I mean, there was a person sitting uh, where I used to give sermon uh, in downtown Chicago. A person always will be in front lines for Friday prayers and sermons. Didn't see him for a while. And uh, when I saw him, I gestured him to stay after the prayer. And I said, where were you? It turned out, he said, well, I went to, uh, you know, perform my uh, uh, pilgrimage to Mecca. When I came back, officers met me at the airport and they, uh, they told me, interviewed me and wanted me to spy on some people. When I declined, uh, they, they say, well, then we have something on you. And... Uh, he was uh, detained and the bottom line thing was a $3,000 invoice with somebody, mm -hmm. he was a businessman who made in his office and that invoice was incorrect. So he was charged with money laundering 
But the point, and he spent two years in prison for that, $3,000. And what was not told to the court was that invoice person who made the invoice was planted by FBI. So that was the secret evidence on which the jury didn't know. So they gave him uh, two years in the prison. And when he released, that's how I came to know. So, 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 so what you went through is something a lot of your brothers and sisters in Muslim community and also in, in neighbors of other faith who for somehow refused to cooperate or collaborate on somebody else went through. And I personally feel sorry that there were two Muslims who were involved in giving false testimony against you. And I hope you pray for them, uh, pray to God that uh, he forgives them for what they have done. Uh, but this is part of a our criminal justice system in which people just get implicated one way or the other when somebody wants to get you. And uh, so, so is your, I heard that you're writing a new book. Are you going to do a little bit about on our justice system in this world? And then real judges, God Almighty, who we beg will forgive all of us. Yes, criminal justice system. There has been a legislation passed by the House of Senate and President Trump signed it that is a first step act is called and it is just the first step but it's a very positive one and my second book that's finished but not published yet we're we're waiting for a movie script on the book to be finished so the book can be more aligned with the movie potential movie and it'll deal with the criminal justice system it will talk about my time in prison and it, when i met so many inmates so many that had were falsely accused. Many deserve to be in prison. But I would say, my experience, about a third of them need a mental institution not to be in prison. And another third should be sent home because they were nonviolent offenders. And they were the, it was clear when I read their, their legal story that they were, the charges were exaggerated. Then a third probably deserve it. Now, my figures are probably not exactly right, but that's my estimation. So I'm glad the House and the Senate and President Trump signed this critical bill. And that's a hopefully whomever is president next, Biden, will uh, continue the second step act. And, and so does this address uh, this type of Im implicating people? Does this phenomena of trapping people, implica implicating in with law enforcement forces people to uh, testify against you, some of these things will be included? Are they part of that whole reform? Yes, they have to be. And some of them are in the first step act. And the second act, or the second bill, I hope, hopefully, will come next year when the new Congress takes over, will include further, deeper exploration into prohibiting this type of ex extortion manipulation. Like the, the two people in my case, they said, if, if you testify that Mark Siljander actually lobbied for you, because I say I didn't lobby for them, that then they received probation, both of them. And I went to prison, which is, and I have forgiven for them. I have prayed with them, uh, for them. So it's critical not to be angry. And it's easy to be angry when, when you're crushed and, and sent to a horrible place and your finances, your reputation, everything seems lost. And then they tell you, you have, you're gonna have three months or less to live. I mean, it was quite devastating, but God showed me that I deserved worse. You know, that my life, uh, what I did in Congress and such, uh, nothing illegal, but he said, you pushed arms and uh, for rebel rebels fighting communist regimes and for regimes fighting communist rebels. And those arms killed men, women, and children, even though that wasn't your intention. So God humbled me and showed me that he was being a Rahman Rahim, even though I was in prison. And put, looking back now, eight years later, all I can say is subhanallah. Praise God. 
praise be to God. And Jesus in Aramaic said the same supan de Allah. You hear the similarity? Supan de Allah, supan Allah. Same. Thank you so much, Congressman uh, and Ambassador Mark Siljander for being with us. Uh, it, it, it truly humbles me that a person who has served our country with honor in search of the truth, helping our country uh, build bridges of understanding, have to suffer in this world in this particular way. I can tell you that, inshallah, God willing, better days are coming in this world and even better days in the hereafter. Amen. Thank you so much for being with us. Shukran. Shukriya. And, and God, Allah ma'a. God bless you. Thank you. And thank you, Sher Dil Khan and Dr. Abdul Wahid for producing today's show. And thank you all for watching this show. This show tells you what Muslim Network TV is about. It's about building bridges of understanding between Muslims and their neighbors, uh, whether they believe in something or they do not believe in. But understanding each other is critical for humanity to thrive and move forward and liberate ourselves from fate, fear, hate, and anger. You're watching Muslim Network TV. We are always there 24 7 on Galaxy 19 satellite covering whole North America and on Raku TV, Apple TV, Amazon Fire TV. Uh, you can download our app, Muslim Network TV, on your iPhone or Android. And our website is muslimnetwork.tv. Peace. Salam.